Trevor Horn is one of the world's most successful and innovative producers, sometimes referred to as the man who invented the 80s. In this part, we talk about his new project, Trevor Horn Reimagines the 80s, as well as taking a look at the multi-track sessions for Owner of a Lonely Heart by Yes and Trevor's updated version. I thought when I you know, do Reimagining the 80s album, I thought I might as well make it sound really big sometimes because nobody's making any big records anymore, you know, can't afford to, so I might as well make it big. And, you know, it's, it's some of it is a bit, you know, um, I have made all kinds of records, but I suppose if it's my name in the 80s, it's going to be a bit bombastic, you know. But I don't have to make bombastic records, you know. I've made other kinds of records as well. It, but, you know, sometimes it's more fun to play to your strength, you know, you not try and be somebody you're not. I could do it, you know, I could, you know, there's all different kinds of being a producer and I've done most of them and I enjoy most of them. What I don't enjoy is doing the same thing over and over and over again, you know, so. I guess it's um, taking a song like Duran Duran's Girls on Film and imagining that instead of Duran Duran writing it, that, they, that um, a writing team had written it and had done it with a girl band. That was um, one of my ideas. Another one was, um, you know, like taking a song that was sung by a, originally sung by a man and having a woman sing it. There's an orchestra involved, and that was part of what made me want to do it. Because you don't often get to work with a 65-piece orchestra these days in the music business. And I thought, well, maybe it'll be the last time I get anywhere near that size an orchestra. So that was an appealing thing, too. We haven't taken old records and put strings on them, you know? That's a totally different concept. You know, we've actually rearranged the songs. Well, the project started, um, I think, a year ago, last June, here, where Julian and I sat for an afternoon and talked about whether the idea was worth doing and what we could do with it and how we would do the strings, given, you know, all those kind of things and, and a list of songs. And we made a list of 20 songs. And then we worked on it. We worked on it a lot in L.A. Um, and the studio in my house in L.A., uh, and then at Christmas, it burned down. So, I mean, only completely. So, I rented another house in LA and we worked there for a few weeks. Um, to, well, for a couple of months actually. Made a studio in one of the bedrooms, you know, and made the, um, made one of the wardrobes into a vocal booth. I'd seal and all kinds of people in there. I chose them primarily on the lyrics uh, because I, I think lyrics are incredibly important. I don't know, some people don't necessarily agree with me, but uh, to me, if the lyrics no good, the song's only sort of half good. I'll, you know, I'll give, I'll, I, in the past I've given a few people um, pass cards on lousy lyrics, like for instance Jeff Lynne and ELO. The lyrics for ELO were never great, but the records were so cool, you kind of let them get away with it. Um, but I chose the songs that I thought still related because they were, most of them were about relationships between people, you know? Dancing in the Dark is actually Bruce Springsteen getting a bit grumpy and writing about how he can't, uh, he's trying, he has to write another song for his album. But it, it, but you know, it's a very well written song. The lyrics beautiful. It's sort of, it, it, it's also, it's the same thing. You know, when you want to get something going, you know, in your life, you know. Before I even did the album, we had we had that arrangement of "Slave to the Rhythm," because Julian had done it, um, but it was never used. It was meant to be for something. I can't remember what it was for, and I always thought it was the most beautiful arrangement. 
So we had that before we started. Um, Steve Hogarth came up with the idea of, uh, of doing Ashes to Ashes because I went to see him one night and uh, just him and a piano. And I saw it and, and he ended up singing uh, Life on Mars. Uh, and so I said, why don't you do a, why don't we do a Bowie track on this album I'm doing? And he said, Ashes to Ashes. And, uh, and then he sang it and Seal heard it and he wanted to sing it. And Seal suggested it's different for girls. So uh, Steve Hogarth ended up singing that one. So it kind of went round a bit, you know. Different things happened. I originally, um, I originally did the arrangement of Take On Me for Il Devo. Uh, I met them, you know. I thought it would be funny, Il Devo doing Take On Me, but they bailed on me. And, um, and then I tried a few other people. And then I tried three straight singers. And they did it, I mean, absolutely like it was from an opera. Ah, but I didn't like it, and I ended up, I ended up using the demo, you know. Well, what was initially the demo? Um, it's the, it's like the the arrangement demo that I did, you know, to send to El Devo. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't get. They didn't do it. Who knows? String arranging isn't isn't the thing you you do together, you know. I I would. Uh, we would have the idea for the song, and Julian would do a sketch and. I'd react to that, and then we'd, you know, we'd go backwards and forwards. Julian's very good at doing, uh, you know, fake string demos. And man, you know, the orchestra really had to go to keep to get up to the uh, to the fake strings. It's it can be hard sometimes. Um, and what would happen is I would get the string arrangement and I'd work on it, get the, do the vocals, edit it, change the arrangement all over the place, keep sending it to Julie, sorry, another eight bars in the middle. Can we do this? I want to go to a jazz bit here. I've sketched it out, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was going backwards and forwards between us and inevitably whenever I started working on something, I cut the hell out of it in some way, you know, chopped it right, chopped it up and changed the arrangement. So it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride, the album, you know. This is the original multi-track. This, this is the raw data. This is what's on the analog machine. Okay, the first play, the first thing on this that makes this unique amongst all Guess songs is the first first time they ever played with with a click, right? Because we laid down a um, a drum machine part first that I programmed in, in with Chris Squire and um, in an MPC. And we laid that down, of course, because it's because we're from the 80s and it's analog. We don't have that anymore because you could never afford the tracks to keep the drum machine. Um, so we did the, the first thing that we did was the drums on their own. And <laughs> I don't know, I, I was very um, into Stuart Copeland at the time. So I thought that rather than going for a big big low snare drum we go for a high snare drum so here's what the drum sounded like that's alan white playing playing to a click as you can hear the snare drum is pitched really high if i take the kick out and the hi-hats you can hear it It's got a little bit of, uh, he's, he's recorded it with a little bit of gated um, lexicon on it, you know? Um, anyway, that snare drum sound caused massive consternation. I mean, people didn't just dislike it, they hated it. Um, <laughs> for a long time. Um, but I always thought it worked really well with the bass, because if you solo it up with the bass, um, so like the bass and drums. The bass is very deep. Chris had a Chris. It's Chris Squire playing the bass, and he had a Chris had a bass at the time that had a, a chip in it that gave him a phaser and a low octave. So if you hear the, hear the bass and drums together. Al 
I'll solo up the. Uh, I'll solo up the bass. Hang on. You can hear the solo octave. It was a really tricky sound to mix, but it worked really well with the drums. So that was the uh, that was the rhythm track. Um, I guess I always remember doing the intro. The intro uh, we did on purpose, like like the intro on Trevor's demo, where it started with um, it started with a sort of power chord guitar. And this was something I thought I thought I'd do it in about an hour, and it took us all day. And then the sound changes. Great. The thing that the thing that really knitted the rhythm section together, because when we first did it, we you know we had the the guitar, we just had that guitar part. Now, right at that point there, a really great guitar part comes in that knitted the whole track together in my... It was a kind of the, the last piece of the jigsaw to make it work. And it's Trevor Rabin, who's brilliant at coming up with stuff. That's a 12-string... Uh, Rickenbacker. A great part. That was pretty much the whole of the rhythm track, you know, it was just that, you know, just those three things with a few little keyboard things. But this was the, uh, the stuff that really grabbed everybody's attention with these whiz bangs here. They were. <laughs> Funny when you listen back to them, and it's quite a few. These were things they were originally on the demo as um, as mini moog fills, you know, beep, beep. But I thought it would be interesting to do them with weird sounds, and like that's taken from a cassette. Um, this one here is. That's made up of six tracks, that. Beep, de lily lum. And let me just solo it up. I mean, now, nowadays, everybody's used to this kind of thing, but back then. <laughs> That's a, a sync clavier in a Fairlight. And we did lots of those in this. Uh, there's something else there as well, is that? No. This lot. These just put the guitar. Uh. These are all the funny bits, you know, and of course, that's a sync clavier. You can hear Trevor bending the bending the note. Yeah, and this is this is the bit Alan White played this on the Fairlight. It was two samples on the Fairlight. Man, when he played that, we laughed our heads off. It so it's a pretty interesting track. I mean, it's in the key of A, and this is this is the John. Where is John? Now John would never do, um, he, he wouldn't do, he wouldn't let me comp him, he wouldn't like do six takes, you know. He just sang the song. 
So you had to drop in on it. It's great. Move yourself. You always live your life, never thinking of the future. See how high he is. You and you, and that's the only way. Shake yourself, your every move you make. So the story goes. Give your free will a chance. You've got to want to succeed. That's that's high. No matter dying back then. The modern version of it. Well, for kickoff, this is, you know, the original version of this was done at a time when I was a, a lot younger. We were all younger. Yes, we were still, you know, still in their heyday. Now it's, you know, 2018. So this is not an innovative record in the way that the original was. And it has a lot of similarities because I felt like I had the license to, to do that with it um, because I wrote the verses, the tune and the lyrics. So it's kind of my song a bit. I mean, it's really Trevor Raven's song. Anyway, so we, we kind of start off in a similar way, except instead of guitars, we've got strings. This is just strings and tim. And you can see we're in a lot lower key. Move yourself. You always live your life, never thinking of the future. Move yourself. If we break this down, most of it's the orchestra, you know. I sort of dropped the chorus down and then I went into three, four for four bars. Now we got the drums in, but the drums aren't like the demo. They're much more like your kind of modern drums. And it's a real drum track, but, but it's been sort of looped and messed around with a bit. And the bass, the bass is. The drummer makes funny noises when he plays the drums. I, I don't um, I don't have a sub octave on the bass because um, it's in such a lower key. So you know we, we've kept the arrangement sort of the same up to a certain point. Uh, when we hit the middle, we sort of gone we went a bit crazy with the middle. This was just something I did for fun because we used to do it live. And sorry, and going to some crazy jazz thing. That's uh, Alan Clark playing the hammer. It was always just like the way it, uh, when we played it live like that. It drops back into this. So this is, you know, similar but different. 
sort of kind of the same sort of guitar solo. And then we're back into the end. And here I put it into sort of three, four. These are the themes that are in the single. So it's quite different from the single. Bang. So it's sort of um, reminiscent of, it's reimagined, as they say. Yeah, we did a lot of what we did, what we did with samples, we did a lot of it acoustically, you know. Some of the bangs and the crashes. It's sort of like an organic version of it in a way. A romp through it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Also, check out part one for some great stories from Cheva's past and present. Please.